Now, for all of you in this room, and particularly for the man standing next to me, farming is not just a job, it's a lifestyle. And for many of you, it's in your blood. Generations of men and women who've chosen to stay on the land and produce food, textiles or fibre, the one thing that they need to know about is the changing way we farm. And many people who've joined me on this stage are leading by example. Grant Sims, as I learned yesterday, is leading by great example. His wife Naomi and their four children are inspiring a whole generation of farmers to rethink the way they operate. Following in his father's and uncle's footsteps, utilising no-till methods since the 80s, Grant has replaced synthetic fertilisers with biologically made liquid fertilisers, drastically reducing chemical inputs. In fact, um, they did all this at the same time, took out chemicals, anything that ends inside, you'll hear him say means death, and adopted multi-species companion and cover crops. Please make him feel warmly welcome here in Mackay. All right, thank you for that very nice introduction. And um, no, thanks for having me up here. And um, yeah, it's great to see everyone coming along. Um, I was involved or president of Vic No Till um, down home for a number of years and we used to put on these great events. So I know what's involved in putting them together, but I just think it's really good that farmers can come along to this and share and learn f um, with each other. So yeah, I'll just, uh, so today we'll just share what we do on our farm. It's not to say it's, what you do, we still make mistakes and we're still learning, but um, we're never really afraid of making mistakes as well. Like, as long as they're only little ones that aren't going to hurt you, they're, they're how we learn, how we grow. And then if we can share these together amongst ourselves, we all grow faster. Um, Is that... Oh, this bloody kid. Is that clicking? This, um, this clicker's not working. Every time this happens, you should think I'd um, have this. There we go, I'll just do that. All right, so, um, yeah, we're from northern um, Victoria, Chuka. Our um, average annual rainfalls, well, it's actually about 400 mils a year now. Um, as you can see, it looks like we get about 30, 40 mils every month, but probably most of it is through the winter. And summer we can go for, you know, six months from September through to May without a rain, or we can get... Um, large rainfall events, summer storms. So one thing we focus on, you know, it's not just, it's a system that we try and do. And, and how do we capture and utilise this moisture so we can either, um, you know, store it in the soil and use it later when we're growing a crop or, or we use it, you know, out of season and, and opportunistically where we use the cover crops and things like that. Um, so we farm about 8,500 acres of clay Oh, I'm gonna to have to do this again. Um, sorry about this. Yeah, like, uh, yeah, so I'm a sixth generation farmer. Um, my grandpa said when he was putting this together, they, used, they were cropping, we've been over 140 years on our land, cropping, growing crops and running sheep. Um, he, they used to run two teams of nine draft horses, putting in the crop, it used to take them about nine, uh, two weeks, sorry, to do about 150 acres. Today we run 350 horses with a 12 metre disc. Um, we can do about the same area in four hours now, so um, technologies and things are really improved. I'll talk about this later, but the disc seeder is a really good tool we use for, um, we were direct drilling or no tilling, but when we went to a disc, which is zero tillage, we could see our soil structure really start to improve and it allows us to keep cover and sow through all kinds of stuff. Um, the other thing we use is another tool to help maximise ground cover is a stripper front when we're harvesting our um, grain crops. Uh, gra you know, my ancestors were the first ones to bring these strippers in um, back in the day from uh, England. These things here, when we use a normal knife front in a six tonne wheat crop, we're doing um, 35 tonne an hour using 60 litres of fuel an hour. When we put these stripper fronts on, we can go down to 40 litres an hour fuel, fuel, but pulling off 65 to 75 tonne an hour. So it just plucks the heads of grain off, leaves everything else intact. Really good grazing value, and I'll, yeah, I'll get into a bit more of that later. But today I just want to talk about how we get this going again. Um, structure, life, worms, things in the soil. Um, you know, when I got back full time on the farm, that's me dad and his brother and my grandpa and me, they were pretty innovative, They're growing sunflowers there, they did uh, a lot of gypsum and lime and, and really were early adopters of no-till, 
back then you couldn't buy knife points to, um, you know, everything was for tillage, so he made his own knife points to weld onto a chisel plough, so they'd got all that working, but one thing I was asking about when I got back was my job was in the boom spray. I was, you know, we were putting chemistry right, we were doing all this stuff, but I was like, why aren't we seeing any of these things anymore in the paddocks? And um, this is now what we've got, worms everywhere. That's me little bloke, Hunter. When I, you know, I took him some convincing to grab that because he thought it was going to bite him. But now he just, he loves the worms. He's a real little, um, you know, fisher and hunter little fella. So um, it's good fun now. We've got the kids all involved and in seeing this stuff come back. So some of the things we did to get this happening, 2008, we did away with um, the synthetic fertilisers that Christine's been talking about. No more seed dressings, like the commercial sides, and I'll talk about an alternative, what we did. Fungicides, insecticides, two most detrimental sides to the soil biology. They went, and then we started focusing on um, rotations and diversity. So we installed a liquid system. We did this all ourselves. We can do this very cheaply. You can buy all these fancy fittings that cost you $16 a fitting, or you buy these 50 cent fittings from a truck shop, you know, when they away. You know, there's ways we can do this a lot cheaper. So we were buying a liquid fertiliser made up in um, South Australia that had all the trace and macro elements, fish oil, worm juice, everything, really good product. And it really improved our soil, fungi, and, and when we did chusu and um, sap tests on plants over the years, they were getting better and better. We weren't low in zinc, we weren't low in copper anymore. Um, so that was really good. We are doing that for a fair while. We are buying this stuff for about $4 a litre. Um, and going through about 80,000 litres a year. Um, so you do the math there, I'm thinking, well, how do we become more efficient in, you know, with our input costs? Um, and so the next thing, we started making fertiliser ourselves. We've since put up this big um, shed. Um, we've got three 9,000 litre um, tanks. We brew the liquid, it's called a biofermented liquid fertiliser. So we've got, I think, seven 5,000 litre tanks to brew in, three 9,000s, and then we've got four 16,000 litre tanks. We'll get the rumen, the, the paunch of the, uh, the first stomach of a, of a cow. We put it in one of the tanks. We add milk and molasses to feed the, sh uh, the, the microbes, like the sugar and, and the protein. We lock it up under air lock so we don't let any pathogens in. We let that go for four or five days. And then we can then, we've multiplied those um, microorganisms, then we can split them into other tanks, feed them again, then we add the individual sulphates. So we can add manganese to one tank, moly, zinc, whatever we want. You know, we can tailor make blends now, so when we're doing tissue tests, we, make, we can really put this highly available, plant available, we're using the microbes to chelate these minerals and make them plant available. And, you know, this is, you know, the cost we saved in making it ourselves in year one paid for that shed, all those tanks, and I was able to put on another labour unit, so we're creating jobs now for our uh, community as well. Um, I'll see how this goes. This is a little video. This is just uh, pretty basic. We've got the one-way val valve on there. I don't know if this will play. Um, actually, I'll put a click on there we go. So this is when, when they're fermenting, you'll see the lactose or underwater there. It'll be bubbling away, bubbling away. And this is after like a month or so we've done this. Then we'll pump that out, um, spray tank individually. So we have to do them all individually. Then once we've gone through this process, we pump them out and then we can mix them all together. We run it through a vibrating screen here we've got. It's a bit of a mess to shed here because we were um, yeah, flat out trying to get all this done with the sewing last year. And then this is a, this is a self-cleaning vibrating screen. Um, it, it, it'll pull out all the solid stuff that's going to give us trouble with the boom sprayer in our, um, you know, in their cedar and then filter it off. We can put different screen mesh screens in that to get down to 100 mesh, 50 mesh, whatever we want. So. It's a really good tools we've set up to do large amounts of this. So we'll probably make 200,000 litres of this, the bioferts every year. We make lactobacillus, um, you know, probably 20,000 litres of that a year. We use that as a prebiotic to put on our plants um, to, instead of fungicides. So I'll talk, you know, throughout this time is there's ways we can, you know, if we see disease or insects, they're just symptoms, so something's out of balance. Usually it's biology or a nutritional thing, if we can address that nutrition and biology 
It's sort of like just flooding the leaf with good guys, then the pathogens and the bad guys don't get in. Also then we're finding when we do this, we're lifting our bricks, we're making the plants photosynthesize at a higher rate and with, um, a greater feed value. So yeah, this didn't all happen overnight, it took a few years, but um, you know, I think it's important to have a goal and give yourself time because we have to wean off some of these chemicals and some of these synthetic ferts because when we've been used to giving these out, you know, what happens the soil biology becomes lazy and I got told one day it was like handing out welfare to the biology. So they don't have to work anymore, they're getting a free lunch. So we've got to start training them up to go back to work and wean off these things. Um, you know, part of, a big part of it is soil structure, how we get that. And this was a really good example. Um, this is on the Terek Plains, uh, west of Echuca. 16% base saturation sodic clays. Um, 2015, we had 160 uh, mils growing season rainfall. Um, right at grain um, grand final weekend it was, it was flowering and starting to set grain. There was four days in a row of 40 degrees Celsius. Um, so everyone was saying that's going to be a crop killer, especially in sodic soils where you've got more salt in the system, makes the plants thirsty. Everyone was starting to drop crops for hay. Well, we cut that, oh sorry, we harvested that and got 1.9 tonne to the hectare of grain off 160 mils. So it was, it was really exciting to get that in a dry, tough finish. This is another thing to illustrate stuff that um, um, Christine's been talking about with the mycorrhizal fungi. What was really interesting, we'd been doing trials. We do a lot of trials on our farm and I always like to um, share and learn from how, what happens. But this is on the, on the left, or on this side, sorry, was the um, synthetic map um, at 70 kilos, standard practice. And on the other side was our biological liquid fertilisers. So this is taken that day, I took that last photo at grain filling. It, this was about four o'clock in the afternoon, it was 40 degrees Celsius. But as you can see here on the wheat, those, the flag leaf on, on the uh, map plants are completely pinched up and, and they're under a lot of stress because of the heat. But this was photo, with the, which was the whole rest of the paddock. So I had the NVT guys that do national variety trials come and did this for us. Um, the rest of our wheat, where we've got mycorrhizal fungi happening, is an extension on the roots. It helps for heat, stress, frost. There's so much stuff that that helps. So if we can facilitate that, and like Christine has talked about, this is a photo ex a demonstrating how that mycorrhizal fungi is not working there. We've burnt it with the map. Now we're under heat stress and the plants are under stress. We've done tissue tests on this, those crops. On the map, we were using 15 units of P, and on that side, two units of P. In the tissue test, this had below average P in the leaf because it's now all locked up, unavailable. And on the other side, we had above average P in the leaf. Even though we've only, and you know, this is about four or five years in, we've been using two units of P. Our Olsen P's are going down, but we're still getting more P in the tissue test. We've now got fungi. So that was all good in the, in the dry years, but then how, you know, in a good season, we had 2016, um, all our wheat, oats, barley, everything we grew doubled our long-term average. Um, probably used, you know, I think 30 to 40 litres of UAN that year, no fungicides, insecticides, you know, very clean crops, no disease, but we just make sure we get our nutrition right and um, the biology on the leaf. So how some of the principles that we do to, to make this all work? It's not just about one thing, it's a whole system. Eliminate or minimise tillage. So, you know, if you've got to do it, you do it, but don't go overdoing it, like Christine was saying earlier. Keep the soil covered, so important. Um, Maximise diversity and rotations. Minimise chemical and synthetic inputs. Stop compaction is one I, I've sort of added into that the Americans have sort of got these five principles, but um, that's a pretty big one for us. And, and integrating livestock. Um, so I was over in America a few years ago, uh, went to a few conferences and then got asked to go back and speak there and I was telling them what we're doing and at the time they said, well, it's all good but you're missing one thing. We, we used to have sheep, we got rid of them to concentrate on disseeding and controlled traffic and they said, you're missing the livestock. It's a crucial part of the um, system and I started thinking about it and I, I thought we always had sheep and on some of the poorer soils they were actually good tools and so I had me boys at the time filling in dams through the summer because I was sick of going around them with the cedar and I had to ring them back up and say, you better start, turn around, go the other way and dig them out again because I think um, we might need to look at this. Um, the other thing they taught us or we got 
found out that year in the States was what Rocky Mountain oysters are. And um, <laughs> I thought they were trying to stitch us up, but we went to a pub and you could get them on the menu. We ordered a couple of bowls. They tasted pretty good. It was like popcorn chicken. But um, they come from a bull anyway is a bit of a hint. So this is a good one, Theo, for you, mate, for the kids to do. This is a, like a soil test. You can watch this on YouTube. I hope you appreciate my farmer scientific um, science test here. I've cut up one of my boys' yabby nets here for this test, so he wasn't real happy. But what we're doing, I talked about it yesterday, so I'll quickly go through it. But just get two vases, fill them with water to a measured amount, get some zero-tilled soil and cultivated soil, put them in. Um, as you can see, the, the glue or the gold malins from the, what the root exudates leave behind give that soil structure and glue it and hold it together. So that's what's happening on there. On that side, tillage breaks that apart and all of a sudden, you know, this is 30 minutes later, the, our zero-till soil, there's very little that's fallen, the, the water's still clear. This side is fully dispersing. So what you see then in um, soil when that happens from tillage is either when you get big rains and the, the soil fine particles run off the soil or this was what happens on the bottom. That picture's there, a new farm we bought a few years ago. It had been knife point press wheel, so no till, but just one tillage pass with the knife point a year, creating those fine particles. And so this, I took this photo, I talked about it yesterday, when you have an inch of rain and you go out in the paddock, it's a good way to see how your soils are performing after an inch of rain. Put the shovel in, so in this soil here, I tap the shovel, the top two inches nice and crumbly fall off, moisture there, the bottom of the shovel, hard, dry, like a brick, no moisture. The bottom photo there is soil from our system that's been in a lot longer. I put the shovel in, push it in easily with one foot, middle of summer, tap the shovel, there's no hard blocky plates anymore, it's all gone crumbly the whole way. You can't tell the difference between like that top horizon and bottom in the shovel anymore. I've got moisture at the bottom. Now, in this top situation, which is most of the time what we see, you get a week or two of hot weather following that, and that moisture sitting in that top two inches, it's pretty quick to evaporate and we've lost it, even if you've got good cover. On the bottom, we can get that moisture down deeper. We've found, you know, with moisture probes and stuff, we can get it down under 30 centimetres quickly. We can store and hold that and, and, and protect it there for when we want to use it later, or then when we do establish plants, We've, the roots can get going quicker into that crumbly stuff and, and gives them a greater chance. So it's really important. How do we get that subsoil, like changing it like that? That far right sort uh, photo is roots. Roots can, like Christine says, you'll hear it all day, build soil. We're now getting roots into those, those um, harder soils and breaking them up. This is a real good tool I was talking about yesterday, a penetrometer. It detects hard pans, soil moisture content, compaction and um, low aeration. So it's got a pressure gauge. Um, I'm going to wreck something here. Um, just here. And it'll tell, it'll tell you how much PSI is in your soil at different levels. So it, it tells you where your hard pans are. Now, most roots, when they hit 300 PSI, they go sideways. Things like sunflowers, those tap-rooted radishes and things, they can hit six, 900 PSI. And it's a real cool experiment. If, you, if you've got a cover crop or something growing and you've got a radish plant in there, go up to the, um, the radish plant, put that penetrometer like a foot from the side of it and, and watch it go, and then you put it on the middle of the tuber and it just goes bang, straight through. Because those roots will create the channels. This is how important this is you know, for us now. With the, like in 2018, 110 mil growing season. This is a difference on the, on the left side of the fence to the right side. That's full cultivated over the summer. This side here, we're still harvesting that grain. We had less rainfall that year, 1982, they didn't even pull the headers out of the shed. Well, we had less rainfall than 82, and, and not just us, everyone in the district was harvesting. So no-till has definitely helped that for us in our area. Another way we can get the um, subsoil broken up is, uh, is worms, dung beetles. We've got now heaps of worms drilling holes. They create channels, you know, um, for roots and air and, and moisture to go. Dung beetles as well. Um, we've been releasing heaps of dung beetles, summer active, winter active. We've now got a dung beetle nursery where I'm dung beetle farming as well. Um, they're spring active ones. Um, so yeah, they're a really good tool. I'll talk about mindfulness about insecticides and things later because we've got to be careful in the drenches and things with these as well. Um, like we are talking about before, these plants, we want to get them, the radishes, 
Um, doesn't have to be a tillage radish. There's heaps of different radishes, daikon radish, whatever. This was one put in in February. We did the soil pit in June. It had um, its roots down 1.5 metres in, in that three or four months. We keep them well hydrated so they work hard with the good Victorian bitter for you Queenslanders. But um, <laughs> vomit bombs, as some people call them. But um, yeah, no, these plants are amazing what they can do. They're, they're scavengers. And so those tubers, they'll scavenge down and, and, and find nutrients and things that leach throughout the profile and bring them up and, and fill up that tuber. There, that tuba, that which cattle can eat, they're really good. Um, when they when they rot down, they 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 form like a carcass and they die down. They'll inoculate the soil from nematodes. Bio, they're like a biofumigant. These brassicas, um, the Americans say they're like a Red Bull for worms. And I've dug up red soil where I've had a radish tuber, and the V where the tuber is is completely black and full of worm casting. So they're they're a pretty cool um, plant for that. This is another slide I got from the States, um, phosphorus concentration around radish holes. So the dark red is, is high concentration and then it, and it goes down, you know, shaded colours. So they'll bring in phosphorus, all that sort of stuff, sulphur. I've also seen slides of nitrogen at 10 centimetre increments throughout the soil. They put in a radish plant and then they remeasured it and then all that nitrogen's in the topsoil. So they're a really good plant. There's lots of different ones, sunflowers, heaps of different things that can go down and scavenge and bring nutrients back up. Um, so like I said earlier, going to the disc seeder allowed us to do this, which is what we want to try and do, you know, keep them as much cover. That was sowing sunflowers into a cover crop. And, you know, this is sort of when it all works, what we want to achieve. We've got 100% ground cover. You know, that's really good for weed suppression, moisture retention, but also, like I mentioned yesterday, temper re temperature regulation. Um, on, we've done heaps of tests with um, Vic No-Till on this, like... Um, there's probably stuff on their website. Soil temperatures on a 43 degree Celsius day under heavy stubbles, stripper stubbles, under cover crops, under, you know, bare fallows. And it can vary, I think, on a bare cultivated ground, we're hitting 65 degrees Celsius. Under a stripper stubble, we we're probably on a 43 degree heat day, we we're 35 degrees Celsius. And in a cover crop, we're about 27 degrees Celsius. So massive difference. You know, if you think about evaporation at 65 degrees Celsius versus under even a stubble at 35, um, it's going to be a huge difference. But also microbes, like I talked about yesterday. You go to the footy, you go to the, your kids' school, they cook the pies to 65 degrees in a bain-marie to kill the bugs so they can sit in the bain-marie. We go, go to the footy, eat one and don't get sick. If our soil temperatures are hitting that, we're not just suppressing these uh, microbes or they're going dormant, we're killing them. Then you've got to start again. There's a really, I don't have the slide on here, but there's another good one the Victorian DPI did on, on chemical applications and how they crash microbial populations. One application is a seed dressing, crashes it, takes, you know, whatever it is, seven weeks to recover. The next pass, and by the third pass, you're up to 12 months before you recover some of these things. So I think we've got to start thinking about what we do as farmers and look at ways where we can minimise some of these things. Um, we always aim for 100% ground cover either stubble or living plants. I'll just rip through some of these as sort of cropping ones. But this is a difference in our low rainfall environment. This is a neighbour we share farmed him. He took the spinners off the header to bale the straw. Where the straw was laying, you know, the, he the seed, that's the head quality on the, on the right or whatever, this side. Um, that was going malt barley. On the other side, it was going F3 which is 90% of the paddock. And that's, that's the difference between like $180 and $250 a tonne for grain. So your stubble, when you're removing that, it can cost you, you know, might, might make a bit of money in the short term, but we look at this as a long-term thing. And the goals that we follow, okay, we could have made more money this year by baling or cutting it for straw or for hay, but we're in this for long term, so we want to hold on to that and because then next year it, come, it always comes back to you. Um, this is just a quick video. There's no one really cropping here, is there? I might just... This is a stripper front, anyway. Yeah, this is this is an amazing machine. Like, this is in six and a half, seven tonne of hectare barley that's laying flat in the ground. In those conditions with a normal knife front, you've got the front on the ground, you're taking in every bit of straw, you're going probably three k's an hour, using that much fuel, it's that hard on your gear. And here we are flying over this nine k's an hour. It's it's unbelievable machine and um, yeah, really handy for us in, in our soil health, um, what we do. So diversity and rotations. Um, 
We grow a lot of different, um, you know, grain crops, seed crops, companion crops, uh, cover crops. We probably put four or five hundred hectares a year in the multi-species. Um, these are some examples of, um, so when we do an intercrop, it's when we grow two species together, so that's canola and faba beans, and we harvest the two together and then we separate the seed. Um, and then a companion crop is where we might grow two or three together, we knock a few of them out and then we just harvest the one. Um, we never grow canola as a monoculture anymore because it's non-mycorrhizal. It's a scavenger, so we put a legume with it. We can still get our grass control for our rotations with the two. Um, you know, that year most canola was doing 2.2 2 tonne to the hectare with two to 300 kilos of urea applied. This crop went three tonne to the hectare combined with 30 litres of UA in and that was it. No fungicides, no insecticides. We find it all the time, when you add one, you get less pressure from disease insects, you add four, you get less again. When you add eight and 12, like Christine's talking about, that's when some real magic can, can happen. But while I'm going through this system is it's not just all about putting all those seeds out. You've got to make sure you're doing things to get your soil structure right, keep your ground cover, look after your microbes. Um, these are field peas and canola. So they're another good one. As long as the seed sizes are different physical size and different weights, they're really easy to pull apart. Um, what's interesting here, I talked about it a li little bit yesterday in the paddock. These are field peas and radish. Um, you can see the pink, real pink dark nodules on the, on the pea uh, roots there. They're a bit bare, bare white there, Christine, these roots, but, for my, but they're in heavy clay and it, they probably didn't um, get the, the dreadlocks happening at all. It's a bit harder in the clay sometimes, but Anyway, what was interesting in this um, was normally the field peas, we don't see nodules on them until they're about a foot high and then they start requiring a lot of N. When we put these scavengers like radishes with them, they start putting nodules on straight away. Now, we, we don't put the rhizobium on the seed, we inject it in. We find when it's on the seed, you get it clumping around um, the seed, the clustering of the nodules. When we inject it in, we, we're finding nodules down 800 mil right through the roots. Um, so it's really cool. I've been told when you put a scavenger next to a legume, it'll make it fix up to twice the amount of nitrogen as it normally would otherwise. And I dig them up all the time and look, and, and sure enough, you do see a lot more nodules when it is next to a scavenger. Um, another really good one for us, we can get long season wheats in early for, to get some feed going. They've done a lot of work in the Riverina on this by putting companions with wheat. Because in everyone's mind, you put, a, put something else in there, it's gonna rob yield because it's now competing. But every year, the last two or three years, where they've, they've had more dry matter, more biomass early, they've grazed it, they've knocked out the, leg, uh, the brassica and, the, and whatever legume. Um, a big one at home is, you know, vetch, radish and wheat. They'll knock out the broad leaves, harvest the wheat, and they've had a two to 300 kilos a hectare yield increase on the wheat, even though they've had that other plant with it at the start, plus they've got a grazing off it. Now, clovers and radish are a really good one with wheat for us. And I mentioned yesterday, when you buy a single super, it's calcium phosphate. And this is what Graham Sait told me when I was you know, over in New Zealand with him last or a couple of years ago. They put sulfuric acid on it to break the calcium phosphorus bond. Clovers have a very acidic root exudate, sort of like, which mimics like the sulfuric acid. So while they're ex, um, you know, exuding their root exudates into the soil, it'll pry apart the calcium and phosphorus bond, which are the two most important minerals for photosynthesization. I got that one out. Um, another cool one, like oats release compounds that inhibit um, diseases in pulse crops. You know, so there's so much stuff going on within these, the root systems now and there's science out there um, that they're, they're looking at when we plant this, you know, um, buckwheat and lentils, we lift the iron content in the preceding crop. So we're lifting the iron content in the next crop, what's it doing to the animals that are eating it? So we can build, you know, more nutrient density, which means more, you know, healthier animals, healthier people, greater live weight gains. This is a photo I was talking about yesterday that the first time really opened my eyes to the power of how plants can feed the soil and change things and not us always having to put things in the soil to feed it. Now, when we're talking earlier about soil tests, we're focusing on the soluble, the plant available, what's plant available. And that's, you know, we're sort of, oh, we're getting short on this, we need to put more on. But what we should be looking at as farmers or asking our advisors or agronomists to do a total soil test. And we do totals that measures the total portion, the total pool, what's locked up, what's in there, unavailable. Now, the only way to make the unavailable available is through, you know, liberating it through biological inputs, 
Pseudomonas, there's Azabacta, there's all these types of microbes that will unlock these things, also plant root exudates. And buckwheat, like Christine said, is one of the most powerful plants at unlocking phosphorus. This is a cover crop we had. We had some buckwheat seed left over from seed cleaning. I went out with the front end loader bucket and just drove flat out across the paddock and, and sort of flicked it out in a, in a strip. And it's sort of from about here to about there. It's a bit hard to see, but that's where the buckwheat went. We had a couple of inches of rain, that buckwheat took off and grew. And I could see in that strip where the buckwheat was, the oats and the vetch and everything else that was in that mix grew about uh, half a foot had extra growth on it. And the only difference from there to there was that one seed, that buckwheat. So they're very powerful at unlocking the locked up phosphorus and making it available. Now we had a frost not long after this, about a month later, buckwheat, bang, disappeared, frosts out real easy. So this is where we can get creative as farmers, like down home, we can put these summer species in with their winter and then they frost out on their own. We don't even have to spray them out. We can use nature to take them out. You know, we can use, it, you know, where we get the hard frost, um, tropical legumes, all these things that frost out easy. So this is where we've got to start, you know, it gets fun farming again, thinking of all these ideas. We're all the time, you know, I'll put buckwheat with um, our canola and, and other legumes and then half them frost out and then you've, you know, the, but they, they've done their job for the first four or five weeks. We've got that phosphorus release. Um, Another way is to minimise or eliminate synthetic ferts is, you know, like we all know, legumes fix the nitrogen. We're putting beans and different things. I'd love to see you try some beans up here. They love it wet. They love black soil. They, they, they've got a very powerful root system. They're very um, symbiotic relationship with a C4 grass, like especially corn, but sorghum, millet. They'd be great companions. That, um, you know, lentils, some of those things are warm season. Um, crops in the northern hemisphere, so they grow really well in the in the winters up here. Um, we do a bit of so we don't broadcast any urea anymore. A lot of people throw heaps of urea out. It's getting out of control at times. Three to five hundred kilos a year a hectare. Um, now we dissolve. We'll do big volumes like seven ton in the twenty eight thousand litre tank at a ratio of one to four. So out of that volume, when we put sixty litres out, we get fifteen kilos of urea. If we put 80 litres out, it's 20. It's the single most efficient way to apply N into a plant, I'm told. Christine might, but um, it takes the plant less energy to convert it into the plant proteins. So the important thing, we're not putting huge amounts out, just small amounts, but we don't just put N out on its own. We always will do a tissue test, um, sap test. If we're low in calcium, we apply the calcium. We need to sometimes put a bit of N out to stimulate because we get cold and dark and wet um, in our winters. So this just can help, but it, you know, we might be putting 40 kilos a hectare out a year instead of 300. And uh, you know, in our better soils last year, we were matching yields doing that. We put, uh, so always remember, magnify it with a carbon source. So depending on it, what else you're mixing with it, you can use the humic powders. If you're using other you know, stuff, the fulvics are probably safer. Um, fulvic powder. Um, we'll put fulvic powder with the dissolved urea and, and some of our bioferts and we're seeing massive growth, growth response with very little inputs. It's more efficient. Also what we do, and Christine mentioned, every time we're following or doing anything to our crops, I have the BRICS meter, which I'll talk about a bit more on how we use that. I'll take a BRICS test before we do anything, whether it be a herbicide pass or a, or a nutrition pass. And then we'll, we'll go out and we'll do whatever we've got to do. Then after we've done it, we'll come back up to an hour later, do another bricks. If we've seen that bricks go down, that's something we don't want to be doing. If we see it go up, it's good. Sometimes we have to, because we are growing seed crops, use a herbicide to knock out a certain weed. If we see the bricks go down, we'll come back a few days later with some biology, some nutrition, and we'll lift that bricks up again. Um, if we are going to use MAP, MAP, you know, we can buffer it. Um, with uh, some humates, the, um, this is what not to do. We put on, this is one year we, we had to get some of this in on a lease farm because they didn't have, we didn't have enough of our liquids yet. Um, so we put the humate with it, put it out too, too heavy and it all, uh, it went pretty ordinary. But um, you know, 5% soluble humate granules will help buffer that MAP from burning the fungi, I'm told, but also makes it, or helps it from locking up makes it more efficient so you can reduce your, the amount you need by adding a bit of that. Now these are some tr other trials we've done with say your MAP. When, when you do change, like we, you know, guano is another good one we use a bit of at time in the cropping. When we're doing our monoculture, 
uh, sorry, our cover crops, our multi-species, we don't really have to do this. But when we, because we've got all the plants doing all the work for us, but when we've got a monoculture growing grain, we've still got, you know, it's, it's not going to have the ability to do everything we want. Probably can, and people do do it, because I know the Haggerty's do with the worm extract, but we, we put a bit of stuff out just for some extra nutrition. But it's very low input, low units. So this is mapped. What you'll see is you'll get way, way more vigour out the blocks, because it's all soluble all up front. But then later on in the year, you know, it's sort of a tortoise and a hare. Oops, I've gone too far. Um, oh, yeah, sorry. That far photo on the left is where the map is. So it's all gone orange, diseased, fallen over, has ran out. And we've found these ones, they catch up to the end, but they can stay greener, you know, quite a bit longer, another two weeks at times. So you're still in the game if you get a late rain. Um, I'll talk just quickly on the fungi and how important it is. You know, Christine covered a lot of this, so I'll sort of brush through. But, you know, it's very important in influencing soil structure and aggregation. Um, it feeds on living roots, so we need to make sure we've got, you know, as many living roots as we can in the soil to help feed it. Um, you know, we've got to make sure it's, it'll store more carbon. Um, it's really good. We just love fungi, cycles, residues, um, helps the plants get more moisture and nutrients. How can we feed some of these, the fungal foods? Stubbles, brown materials, fish hydrolysates, humates, fulvics, root exudates. Um, Christine said yesterday, like the more the more um, diversity we have in the, in annuals, like then you got your sunflowers, very mycorrhizal. These plants can start. We can start priming the soil with with these annuals um, quite effectively to to get more fungi going. We now see in cropping paddocks mushrooms and things popping up everywhere, which is pretty cool because um, we've got got a lot of fungi going on. Um, so what I want to um, just quickly sort of get people thinking about, especially in cropping, well, probably in all agriculture really, we're, we're all the time, you know, fine, we're treating symptoms. And it used to annoy me if we were going out there and we're spraying a disease or an insect and then next year we're out there and we're doing it again. And really, I'd say, what, have we, what are we doing? We're not doing anything. We're not fixing anything here because we're back next year doing the same thing. So all we did become is treating symptoms. And what, you know... Most of the time, the problem or the cause is starts in the soil. So if we can sort of put some of these pictures, pieces together, we can start treating these causes and the problems and then the symptoms we find disappear. So this is an example of first thing I reckon we could do to start, get rid of the sides off the seed. You know, I remember sending the kids to school when the little kids, they'd come home snotty nose, you know, getting sick. And I said to my wife, maybe we should just keep them home. They wouldn't get um, sick, you know, all the time. And she said that's part of them building their immune system. And then when they're an adult, yeah, they'll be stronger and healthier to fight things off. It made me think about our seeds. We wrap them up. It's like not sending them to school. We, we put all these sides and fungicides on them. As they grow up older, they've got no a natural plant adult immunity. And then we're required. Now there's um, some of the breeding that they're doing. They're getting a lot of yield out of it. But they say as part of the package, we have to factor in a fungicide to grow this crop. These are crops we're harvesting to eat for food. So what we do, we do our um, vermicast extract. We get a, a bag, like a, a filter bag. It's a bit hard to see. That's the regenerative air blower. You can buy these machines for 30 grand or you can buy one of them off eBay for about $400. And uh, there's a, we, I've used an aquaculture tank because it's got a good sump to drain out. You can get a 1,000 litre shuttle, cut the top out. You get good quality worm castings, fill it in the put the hose in the bag, fill the bag up, tie it up, fill it with water. Turn that fan on, it blows 2,000 litres of air a minute through the, through the compost and you're knocking, you're washing, you want to see it go that colour. It washes all the, humate, uh, the, the microbes and things out. We've tested this on farm with a microbiometer so we can test if we've ran the fans long enough and got the biology out. We then can apply this to the seed. We can use this as foliars. We can inject it in the soil as nutrition. The Haggerty's in Western Australia do 50,000 acres of their cropping program with just this alone in sand. They're growing three ton barley. It's unbelievable. Check out jo David Johnson. He's got YouTubes. He's doing replicated trials uh, in centre pivots, growing corn with full MPK, 220 bushels an acre, and then he uses these extracts and he's getting 200 bushels an acre. It's mind-blowing. This, um, this is a trial I did last year with the GRDC. Um, on the bottom... Where is it? Oh, there we go. 
On the bottom there, that's the pink wheat with the gauchos. So they were doing red-legged earth mite trials down south in the western districts. They've got 100% resistant to every single insecticide down there. They can't grow canola and certain crops anymore because they get absolutely smashed by red legs. We haven't used an insecticide or a seed dressing for you know over 12 years or more now, and we, we you know we get them, but they're not going to be detrimental to us growing a crop. So we had GRDC. We put the pink stuff on the seed. This is our seed with the worm uh, juice on, and we put a bit of kelp powder. Um, there's other things we've tried: trichoderma, pseudomonas, um, azabactar, zinc and manganese in a bioferment. Ferment. They're um, really good seed energizers. So there's a lot of stuff we can do to get that nutrition and biology around the plant or that seed, give it more energy to get it, get it punching out of the ground so it can start photosynthesizing. On the bottom, this is after two or three mils of rain. That pink wheat only just shot. Our wheat had 20 mil roots on it covered in little dreadlocks. So it was amazing after two or three mils, the germination speed and what we've done. We've wrapped this stuff here in poison, this stuff here we've wrapped in nutrition and biology. Some of the foliar sprays I was talking about, this is the, um, the worm extract again. Now the good thing with the worm extract, it's not a tea, compost tea, it's an extract. A compost tea, you aerate it and you feed it, and then you grow all the aerobic microorganisms. This is just knocking out all the biology, the anaerobic and the aerobic. So, you know, we want the anaerobic ones in our soils because when... It, okay, I better keep... Um, they're really good. Um, this has got Pseudomonas florenzes in it. It can stop plants, I'm told, um, frosting down to as low as minus six degrees for up to two months. And I've sprayed this sort of stuff on crops and driven around in the morning and the sides of the road are white and out in the paddock, they're all green. It's, and I've had mates that have had frosted crops that have sprayed this on and then gone in and then pulled out and only done half the paddock and gone in with the header and they've gone one tonne of barley to three tonne because they've repaired frost damage. It's pretty cool. And this stuff literally costs you about a dollar a hectare if you make it yourself. Insects, I'll rip through all this because I'll, you know, the importance of insects, but we've got that many predators and um, things in there. You know, we don't ever worry if we get an aphid or something, you know, it's got to have something to eat for the spiders. This is an example. Um, these are faber beans getting smashed by um, lucent flea. I start to ask and think a different way. Instead of trying to kill stuff all the time, say, what is this trying to tell me? You know, we'll do a tissue test. We can see what, you know, it's missing. Generally for us, liquid calcium are five to 10 litres. That's those beans later on in the year, no fungicides, insecticides, clean as. Most beans, you know, get three fungicides a year, that had none. Get the nutrition biology right. I'll rip through this quickly now, but this is the bricks. Um, important, we get a, try and get it over 12. You get less insect disease pressure. 1% lift in bricks, I'm told 45 grams weight gains a day or 100 grams milk solids per cow per day. So all of a sudden, you've, I see a lot of pastures where they've got a heap of urea on them. That drops the bricks, lifts the nitrates, then you get mastitis, you get all these animal health problems, um, getting back into calf. You know, if we're getting, we had some stuff, we made some of it with our bioferts the other, this year, we got our bricks up to 26. So you graze in a pasture at 26 bricks versus a five, you're gonna get a huge amount more live weight gains. This is examples where we had some of our summer north mix up in Gundawindi. They sowed about a 13-way mix there. They had just the worm juice on the seed. They cut that for silage, about 20, 30 tonne to the hectare. Next door, they had monoculture um, sorghum and monoculture millet, a full um, you know, fertiliser program and sides on the seed. Absolutely got smashed by grasshoppers. This was through the fence. Millet, sorghum didn't get touched. They had the bricks and everything humming there. So controlled traffic, I'll rip through this quick. Um, we can, you know, we minimise all our wheel traffic to 11% of our paddock in a 12 metre system. Um, so we can then, that Im helps improve our water infiltration and, and not compacting the soil. How do we do this when we integrate cattle? We have controlled traffic cattle farming now. Um, this is a photo a mate took. Um, so ours aren't as trained as well as that. We're still trying to train them. They sort of wander off the tracks a bit, but when we are grazing them in the paddocks, they do follow the tram lines back to water. So they, they do, in some ways, do some controlled traffic. Um, I've got it. This now on the cover crops, this was the first you know, time um, years ago and we are doing it. This is out in the sodic clays on this side. We've got canola and beans, $100 a hectare on fertiliser, $50 a hectare on seed. Had a heap of rain at sowing, poor establishment, harvested 300 kilos a hectare, absolute failure. 
that side through the fence, about forty fifty dollars a hectare on our thirteen way our winter super mix. We had faber beans on this side, on the and the cover crop side they're up to me chest, and on this side they're struggling to get me to me knee. And this is what when magic happens, like Christine was talking about, when we get that diversity of plants, it was unbelievable. We we drove out here, I drove out with me boys. You know, I had cereal rye about a foot above the roof of my ute. There's probably eight tonne of dry matter we grew there on just that seed and a worm extract and a little bit of liquid calcium. So it's probably $60 a hectare spend. That's it, shut the gate, managed the grazing, pulled up here, my boys got out, lost them for about half an hour, couldn't find little buggers. They're running around in there thinking it was funny. Then I brought the cattle in there, couldn't find them either. Cause, um, <laughs> and the fences weren't real good because we'd sort of let the fences go cropping a bit. Um, we had to climb trees and we had to get motorbikes, we found them, but the live weight gains we were getting off these things is unbelievable. This year we're doing 1.7 to 2 kilos a day on the calves and the cows are doing a kilo, a kilo and a half. Why that happened, Christine talked about this, so this is a really good photo to explain, you know, the different root systems on plants. And if we just have that one, one plant there with that one root system, it's exploring that same area of soil for the same nutrients and moisture at the same time. Now we've got deeper roots going and they're sharing. They share through the fungal associations or that quorum sensing. We all know different plants like, um, you know, or foods and that, like the Brazil nuts have high selenium and um, oysters, zinc, no different in plants. Certain plants have the ability to extract different minerals. So now we've got greater mineral density sharing between plants. We measure this now. You know, here we're harvesting a crop with a big green depreciating machi machine. We've got yield monitors in there measuring our kilograms per mil of rainfall. This is our yield monitors for our four-legged harvesters. We run them on the scales, we run them out in these covers, and then we're, we're measuring live weight gains. We're getting, you know, last year, uh, eight-week joining program, 96 97% back in calf in eight weeks joining while they're doing these, you know, I think greenums at home are about 900 grams a day daily weight gain and we're going 1.7 to 2 kilos now. We've been selling all our wieners at Yay Sales and the, and the Angus wiener sales there and in the, in the last two years we've topped three sales in a row for the highest dollars a kilo. And last year we got $9.15 a kilo and they're doing 1.7 kilos a day. We're growing six, seven tonne of dry matter on a couple hundred mils of rain. That's why we at the moment just keep putting more and more of this in. It's low. You know, well, we just find it on our farm, it's a part of a system, but it's low cost, low risk, and, and we can get really good production, especially when livestock is, um, prices are good. Um, I'll just sit on the grazing. So we'll do 200 hectare paddock. We'll split it in half with a steel wire, and then we run the poly wire. We've made our own poor man's Kiwi Tech um, drum with a ring top post. We put them in, and we'll just graze that. I've done trials where we've had um, one side of the paddock actively graze throughout the, the winter and let the other side get up real big and thick like that. We'll send them in, crash graze that. Next year I come back, that side that we've done that crash graze at Milky Doe, I've got twice the dry matter on. So now with our paddocks we need to rehabilitate. Um, we get grow as much bulk on it as we can and then we'll come in and trample and smash graze it in and that just starts, the primes the pump, gets it really cranking. Another way we can, at home, we can um, this is swath grazing or windrow grazing. So if we want to manage weeds for our cropping without herbicides, we're always looking at ways to find, you know, how we can improve things. So we might drop this for hay, but instead of baling it up, you know, and, and feeding out later, then we send the cattle in there and we put a strip, a wire up and they strip graze the windrows. So any new little ryegrass or anything that pops up we don't want, the cattle usually nip it off. It's a real effective way. We can bank feed. This, we can do this for months and, and, and have feed in front of us. Um, you know, we use the dry summers as a bit of an advantage. Another thing we do, um, which um, you guys were talking on earlier, bale grazing. If I've got a poor area of the paddock that's underperforming or a high weed burden, I'll take a semi load of hay out there. We drop big squares on their side, cut the strings. I'll send a heap of cattle in. They'll smash graze it. I'll put the bales just far enough apart that they can nearly touch each other with their bums. Um, we'll come back the next year into that bale grazed area. I'll be harvesting barley doing a tonne to the hectare. All of a sudden I hit that bale grazed area and now I'm doing three tonne. It is, I've done this with canola with heaps of different crops. It is unbelievable. Um, and the cool thing about this is when we do that is we're repairing soil and getting a yield bump the next year while fattening cattle and making money. And this is what I think as farmers, there's so many times we get told, 
how we can improve our soil, but it's usually at our expense of cost and spending money. We put it in lime, we're deep ripping, we're, we're um, you know, spreading chook manure, whatever. We've had paddocks now that are our worst performing paddocks. We'll drop them into these multi-species for three years in a row. We get a compounding effect then because as the roots start pushing in deeper and punching in, then next year they go deeper again. We're starting to fix more fungi. All of a sudden we'll just graze it. So it's low cost risk repairing these soils, these sodic clays. We'll pull them out of that back into cropping and now some of these paddocks are our most performing, highest performing paddocks. But we've made money grazing them rather than spending money. So that's what I love with the animals, especially cattle. When we first, um, and this is why I love them, the impact that they can make is, is incredible. First time we got some heifers off a neighbour and we ran on cover crops, I went out there with the shovel, we were digging up the soil, I'm finding five or six worms there, five or six worms there. I dug up one of these cow pats and I counted about 20, 30 worms under one of them cow pats. I was so excited, like I rang my wife, I said, you want to sell these worms it's under these cow pats? And she's on the other end going, are you really ringing me about telling me that you got worms in, in cow pats? And I was like, yeah, and so then I had to ring one of my mates because he, he would appreciate it a bit more. But <laughs> these, um, these animals are just a walking, composting, fermenting machine and we can use them. We run them on, we wean the calves in the, in the spring, sell them at weaner sales. We run the cows on our stripper stubbles. They're cycling our carbon to nitrogen ratio. You know, that stubble's going in at 80 to 1, coming out there at 15 to 1. Um, when we use the stripper front, we're, not, we're relieving everything intact on the plant because we just cut the top, the grain off, so all the flag leaf, everything's there. I've done forage tests on this stripper stubble. It is as good as good quality cereal hay. So we can buy, you know, get skinny cows, run them on these stubbles, and we're fattening cows. You know, we, we, we use them as a tool. We used to be having a, if we were spraying stuff, like they, they'll just nip up any thistle or weed. That, so they're, they're a really good tool for us in our, in our cropping system. And I'll, I'll wrap it up, but I just wanted to say, now, the, red, um, the Americans said when you get the radishes going, they're like Red Bull for worms. Well, I say when you add the cattle and the cow manure to that Red Bull, it's like adding Jaeger to a Red Bull, and now it's, it's party time. But, um, and this is what we get. Worms everywhere now. Wherever we follow those cattle in these multi-species, we can amplify that if we have good calcium levels in the soil and good ground cover, good feed for the worms, they, they just explode. So I'll wrap up for some questions now and thanks for uh, listening. Love your passion. Thank you very much, Grant. Um, would you like a drink of water after that? Yeah, got, yeah. <laughs> I don't you draw a, breath. I you have a drink? No. <laughs> but that's what you get when you've got passion combined with a lot of content and valuable information. Um, questions from the floor? Anyone got one straight up? And I want them to be yes or no. So just ask a question yep. that he can say yes or no to. No, I'm joking. Yeah, Dude, good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, quick one, Grant, on, you know, there was a slide you had there earlier on about raising the bricks yep. levels and, you know, a few figures there, 45 grams live weight gain increase on your livestock with a uh, 1% increase of bricks. What's yep. the quickest, easiest, simplest way to increase that bricks level? Because they're massive figures when you start extrapolating them out. I know you said you get nine dollars fifteen, but even at six bucks fifty, it's mm. it's huge money. Oh, it is. It's one hundred percent. So for us, liquid. Well, a good way if you do a tissue test or a sap test on your plants, and and whatever the lowest lacking mineral is, that will, I've been told, like Joel um, told me, Williams. I did a fair bit of work with him. That will give you a great great lift in your bricks. So if you're real low on boron or real low on calcium, you know, add that in. We add a bit of everything. Um, but calcium and phosphorus are good ways to lift and also I've even done it without even nutrients like the lactobacillus that we make mm. and the cow paunch, we'd, we'd brew that up. I sprayed that on field peas last year and they were bricks in at 12 and they went up to 26. It was unbelievable. That, those peas were like pretty well bulletproof for getting anything wrong with them, frost or anything. Um, so yeah, yeah, like the worm juice can do it but, but um, yeah, I always find liquid calcium for us because we're on heavy clays and calcium's you know, a bit of a thing sometimes, so that's usually a good one. Yeah, right. so it's just your most limiting factor. Yeah. Like, yeah. Lift it, yeah. That's what we've found, yeah, and that's what I've been told. The lo whatever your lowest mineral um, is, it just apply that. Well, at probably. least that was Thank a yes you. or no question. The yeah. clarification was needed there. Anyone else got a question for Grant? Wow, you could have asked six. Good. Well, I, I do have another. 
Hang on, Simon's got a question, but yes, if you'd like to ask another one, you you can do that. Uh, it's not a question, it's just an observation. I'll, I'll say, uh, totally agree with you, Grant. When it comes to what's probably going to give you the biggest bang for buck locally, it's probably going to be calcium, particularly for your uh, legumes and your forbs, so your broad leaves. Uh, they need, seem to need more calcium than, and, than anything else and our environment is typically quite low in calcium. So that's probably, if, you, if I had to pick a particular mineral, that would be the one I'd start with. Yeah, and you can... You can oh, yeah, oh, sorry, Grant. No, I was just going to say it's going to be absorbed better as a foliar. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we love the liquid. And you can, there's so many ways you can get um, calcium nitrate, diso you know, dissolve like a kilo or two of that per hectare in water, add a fulvic powder, add some of that worm juice, and bang, you've got a high quality product. Or there's, you know, calcium acetate, there's a few other, but there's plenty of them out there in the market you can buy as well. We've got time for a couple more. Yes, one here. It seems to me you're giving them a full meal deal with your cropping, but do you ever need supplementation? And can you be feeding the ground through the supplementation in the cattle? Yeah, good question. And that's something I actually asked. I had Gabe Brown out a few years ago and I said to him about um, the, with adding minerals and stuff and I mean they're in North Dakota on these minerally rich soils but he said he always puts good mineral supplements with his cattle and if they need it he wants them healthy because he wants their rumen and their, their gut to be really healthy and strong to help inoculate and, and spread the soil. So we, we put some loose slick sort of minerals out with our cattle and we find when they're on the multi species they hardly ever touch them anyway. They, they only... It, if maybe there's a frost for a few days and certain things might not be photosynthesising or locking up as well, they might have a nibble at them then. Or if they're on the stubbles and there's a little bit less quality, they might get at them. But when we're on the multi-species, they rarely touch the minerals, but we've got them there if they need because we want to keep our cattle... We want to keep them, you know, really fine. And they're, they're gut, yeah. Anyone else? One more question? I'll just actually, one little tip. Great, no, you go for it. Like, I'll, I'll, yeah, if, if for people um, that want to make some of these bifurts, like Graham Sait's got a lot of recipes on his um, uh, podcasts and that that you can listen to and he tells you, you can buy stuff off him, 100 litres and turn it into 1,000. And I've done it from 1,000 litres and turn it into 10,000. So it's gone from $1.70 a litre to 17 cents a litre. But if you just go and get a 1,000 litre shuttle, go into a um, plumbing or you know irrigation shop and you get these little grommets it's like a 16 mil spay bit you drill through the lid and you pop this little grommet in and then it takes a 13 mil clear tube and that's what you put in to get and then into a water bottle to give you the one-way valve that's the most important thing once you've got it air locked you can fill the stuff up lock it up seal it air tight and then you brew it for whatever seven days you need a ph meter because you want the ph to be under 4.3 it's sort of like composting. It's got a, once it goes under that range, it, then you don't get pathogens. And as long as it smells good, get into it. And uh, it's pretty fun. Yeah, Simon and Dave Hunter, who are both present today, have made their own uh, biofertilisers. So there's a lot of knowledge in this room. And if you do want to pick anyone's brain, you can always um, ask those questions. And also we have Ken Ede. Yep, Ken Ede. Joining the, us the today. The room's full, full of um, great knowledge and expertise. Please thank... Grant Sims. Yeah.